All right, let's try something out here. What's the first video game character you think of when I say silent protagonist? Go on, I'll wait. Time's up. I'm sure a lot of you thought of characters like Gordon Freeman or Shell. There's classics like Doomguy and Samus, but I bet some people also picked Link and one of the playable characters from the Persona series. Or maybe, if you were thinking real outside the box, you might have said any playable character in an MMO. They're all valid answers, but each of them represent a different interpretation of the silent protagonist. Let's look at the first group of characters I mentioned. Gordon Freeman from Half-Life and Shell from Portal. These are probably the most pure interpretations of the concept. They're existing characters in the world they live in. They have a history you can learn, but you don't really have character development throughout the story. Let's look at Shell from Portal and Portal 2. She wakes up in the first game trapped in a facility. She isn't distraught of being forced to play these games in the metaphorical hands of GLaDOS. Or maybe she is, we just don't know. That's the point of her character. The writers of the game weren't interested in exploring the personal conflicts of Shell. They were interested in how GLaDOS interacts with Shell as a blank slate. And it's a similar case with Gordon Freeman in the Half-Life series. The writers of these games were obviously interested in writing how these various groups of people in hiding from the Combine interact with Gordon and his hero-like status. So there's something I want to look at with all these different types of silent protagonists. And that's examine how the story itself handles the character type. I want to look at how the writers are forced to write around a main character who isn't able to talk to all the supporting characters. I'll look again at Portal here because I'm more familiar with it than Half-Life. I think the writing in Portal and Portal 2 handles the idea of a silent protagonist phenomenally. That's because the events of the story are mostly relying upon other characters acting rather than Shell. One of my biggest pet peeves in games with silent protagonists is when you feel like there's a character that should be speaking but their audio track got muted or something. Borderlands as a series exemplifies that problem for me. I haven't played Borderlands 3, so I can't say if it addressed what I'm going to talk about, so just assume I'm talking about the first three games here. It's a series full of crazy characters and silly scenarios, nearly every character has something funny to say, except for the player character. Granted, the character you do pick has voice lines during combat when they use abilities or whatever, but they're silent for a majority, if not all the time, outside of combat, so they fit my bill for silent protagonist in terms of how the story is written. Side characters will just be talking at the player character, but the player character never has anything to say. Side characters are just a vessel to throw jokes at the player from the writers. I couldn't imagine what having a conversation with a lot of the Borderlands NPCs would be like, but I can imagine talking with the NPCs from Half-Life 2. Even though Gordon never talks, the conversations in the game felt realistic. The writers were smart enough about maintaining the facade of a real world, in spite of a character that doesn't talk for some inexplicable reason. And that's why people love Half-Life and Portal. Next up, I want to talk about MMOs. Specifically, the player character and how they interact with the plot. It's kind of tangential, but it still fascinates me. Stories in video games traditionally revolve around the idea of the player being the chosen one or something like that. It might feel kind of contrived in a single player game like Fallout, but for me it's easy to suspend my disbelief. It's a lot harder to deal with that type of plot point in an MMO though. I've been playing a lot of Final Fantasy XIV recently, so I'll use that as an example. They just ignore it! The game rarely, if ever, addresses the fact that you are one of millions of other players in the same position. It's kind of frustrating, during boss fights they'll talk about how they're fighting the Warrior of Light, when in reality they're fighting four or eight Warriors of Light. To be honest, I can't think of another game that actually does try to address it though. I haven't played a lot of MMOs or other living games, so I'm probably biased, but if you can think of any games that did acknowledge the huge number of player characters, comment it below. I'm curious to learn of what games actually do try and tackle that problem. Final Fantasy XIV's story is basically just like any other Final Fantasy game, but with raids and PvP. It's kind of impressive, really. I've been playing through the series for a yet undisclosed reason, and it's probably in my top five stories of the series so far. If you know anything about the game, it's probably that the base game is kind of a slog. But it gets better than that, I promise. Anyway, in the story, the player character rarely says anything. Occasionally, someone will ask them a question, but they'll just, like, gesture about like they're talking, but no dialogue is actually written. Also, sometimes you can pick between a few options, but it's, uh, it's kind of rare. It still definitely does the character gets talked to thing that Borderlands does, where you're just a vessel to hear what some character is thinking at the time, but it handles in a more believable manner. It also helps that you aren't really alone with one character very often. You're likely to be surrounded by your comrades during any given story cutscene, so they can just bounce off each other while you sink into the shadows. 
This method of storytelling focuses on the supporting characters rather than the player. It's like Half-Life in the way that the writers never really acknowledge the player as a character with depth. But instead of Gordon Freeman running around by himself, there's millions of Gordon Freemans. That, that's it. That's that's all I have to say. Just, just cut it. End the section here. I'm going to spend the rest of this video talking about the last type of silent protagonist. To finish it off, let's look at Doomguy and Samus. They might seem like they fit into the previous category of silent protagonists, but there's one crucial difference that sets them apart. They're both characters that were silent protagonists, but were eventually given voice lines in later games. This is something you see all the time in older game properties being adapted for newer games in their series. With Doomguy, the big change happened in 2020's Doom Eternal. The Doom series was rebooted in 2016 with the plainly titled Doom. It's definitely not the first series to go with a simple name for a reboot of a classic series. AAA games have been trying that for a while with series like Tomb Raider, Thief, and Hitman. Hey, all attempts by Square Enix, isn't that something? Luckily, Doom 2016 was absolutely fantastic. It wasn't exactly classic Doom, but they really captured what people think Doom should feel like. And I think that's an important thing to point out. They didn't slavishly recreate Doom as it was back then. They took the core of the game, running around and shooting, and modernized it. And the developers even added their own little flair to it. They both recreated Doom as we imagined it back then, and created their own interpretation of the franchise. And Doom Eternal, being a sequel to Doom 2016, is an extension of that interpretation. But for some people, they went a bit too far with their own take on the series. It's pretty obvious that the team working on Doom Eternal wanted to push the series forward instead of just making Doom 2016 but with more levels. And boy oh boy did they do that. The game introduced tons of new mechanics, and to some players that draws attention away from what Doom is to them, the running and shooting at mock speed. Instead of running and shooting, you're forced to do a platforming section, or sit through a, god forbid, a cutscene. John Carmack, lead programmer of the original Doom, is famously quoted as saying, Story in a game is like story in a... Can I, can I say that on YouTube? I don't really know what YouTube's doing nowadays, so I'll just err on the side of caution here. Story in a game is like story in a... Eh, movie. It's expected to be there, but it's not important. He commented on that quote later in 2018, adding that while games based entirely on the story can be done well, the most important games have been all about the play, not the story. Whether I think that's true or not doesn't really matter. What I think matters here is that someone so fundamental to the creation of Doom said that. So when the new Doom game featured story elements more than any other game in the series, I can understand why people were upset. They didn't like that the series was going in a different direction than what it means to them. So what does all that have to do with the concept of a silent protagonist? Like I said earlier, Doom Eternal is the first mainline game in the series, that I know of, where he has actual voiced lines. Here's a bit of that cutscene where we hear him speak for the first time. We found him in the valley, just outside the castle walls. He was badly wounded and wearing this. Guts. Huge guts. Kill them. Must kill them all. Hmm. He has fight in him yet. In spite of his youth. Now to a lot of people, that perfectly encapsulates who Doom Guy is. A bloodthirsty dude with an insatiable need to rip and tear. But uh, I'm not gonna lie here. It kind of took away some of the magic from Doom 2016. It was a game that built Doomguy up as this godlike force that can't be stopped by any demon. It was a mystery. You start the game by waking up in a sarcophagus and immediately start killing demons. No time is spent on the backstory in the beginning. You're just thrown into the demon meat grinder. I don't remember how much time is spent on Doomguy's backstory in Doom 2016 overall, but I know it wasn't a lot. And that lack of information about him as a character allowed me to fill in the blanks on his hypothetical character sheet. And when they showed his face for the first time and have him start talking, it kind of contradicts my own headcanon of the character. Now, I'm not necessarily saying it's a bad thing that they're further developing the Doom Guy character. I'm just saying that by adding new character dimensions, they're forcing the player to rewrite who Doom Guy is to them. And if the player doesn't like the direction that the character is taken in, then it might retroactively ruin certain aspects of previous games that they still enjoyed. 
I can still play Doom 2016 today and enjoy the hell out of it. But I won't be able to enjoy the writing of the game as much as I did before Doom Eternal came out, because I didn't like the direction they took Sigma Doom Guy's character traits. Again, I think the developers should be able to do whatever they want with a character, but there's an inherent risk in elaborating on character features that made them iconic in the first place. And for that, we need look no further than Metroid. Other M. If you're a Metroid fan, I don't really need to explain how the game fits into what I'm trying to say here. But for those not familiar, I'll elaborate. Metroid Other M was a game for the Wii that was unlike any other game in the series. Well, it was kinda like Metroid Fusion, but eh, kinda not. Metroid Fusion was the first game in the series to place any emphasis on the story. Metroid Prime came out literally the day before, and Retro Studios put a lot of effort into the story in that game, but the focus was different to that of Fusion. In Prime, the story and lore was given to you by you going out of your way to read logs dotted around the world. There weren't many segments in the game dedicated to forcing the player to pay attention to the plot. That did change in later games, but it wasn't a big thing in the first one. Fusion was more direct in its storytelling, and a more linear game as a result. Once you enter a new area, you enter a dialogue sequence where a character talks to you and you're forced to listen to what they have to say about the plot or whatever. And on top of that, at the end of these sequences, you're often told exactly where to go. Like it'll pan your map to a point and say, go here. It was kind of frustrating to me when I played this for the first time, because I was used to the seemingly open-ended progression of Super Metroid. I say seemingly because the map is kind of linear for someone who isn't a crazy sequence-breaking speedrunner. There are a lot of moments in the game where you feel like you have a ton of paths to explore, but they cut off pretty quickly and leave only one main path forward. I think the map in Super Metroid is really well designed in that it makes you feel like you're exploring this crazy huge map on your own, but you're secretly being led by the level designers along a mostly set path. Fusion partly does away with the developer's invisible hand and just straight up tells you where to go. When a character in the game tells you to travel to the end of this segment of the map and turn on the power or whatever, I feel like that just patronizes the player. In that example, if I enter a map that has all the lights out and the save points don't work, I think any normal player would deduce that they have to figure out a way to turn on the power. Unfortunately, Nintendo took the idea of patronizing the player like that and decided to build a whole game around it. But before that, let me give a little context as to how the franchise as a whole fits into Nintendo's catalog of IPs then going into how it was abandoned in a dumpster out behind a McDonald's, and then spat on. Now Metroid was never a series to top sale charts. Among the best-selling game franchises of all time, there are 15 IPs I would claim as Nintendo franchises that are ahead of Metroid. Hell, Nintendogs is ahead of Metroid. But I think that speaks to how niche the franchise has always been. I'm not really sure why it didn't take off like Zelda or Kirby did, at least in the 80s or 90s. But I think the fact that there was no hit Nintendo 64 Metroid game played a huge part in the size of the franchise today now that I think about it. Mario, Zelda, Kirby, Mario Kart, Donkey Kong, all iconic franchises that transitioned to 3D and were many children's favorite games. But Samus just skipped that generation altogether. I would say this was the beginning of the fall for the series, since it likely fell out of people's minds as they were drawn to a series like Zelda or Kirby that actually got games. But that's not really the case. Metroid Prime on the GameCube is the best-selling game in the franchise. It's the console where Metroid is the closest to being the best-selling game. The other consoles with major series entries have their Metroid for that console in the 20s or 30s, but it's number 7 on the GameCube, so I don't know how Prime fits into my narrative here. It's the best-selling game of the franchise, and was one of the best-selling games on, admittedly, one of Nintendo's worst-selling mainline consoles. I think it's fair to say that while people enjoyed Metroid Prime, it was more of a one-off. It didn't get people interested in the series as a whole. And while Retro probably did the best job they could, it still wasn't enough to capture the general public's heart like Mario Kart Double Dash or any of the Mario parties did. And it's been downhill since then. Metroid is a series that a lot of people hold very close to their heart. And one of the key developers in the original Metroid, Yoshio Sakamoto, wanted to finally give Metroid the attention he thought it, and a lot of longtime fans, deserved. So he started work on Metroid Other M. I'm not going to beat around the bush here. Other M received as much hate as it did because it went against the player's perception of Samus. The whole series is built upon the understanding that Samus is a badass. The first game actually goes out of its way to trick you into thinking that Samus is a dude, only to reveal that she's a she. That trick is to show that this woman is as strong as any dude, and as sexist as that might sound. While we live in a society with many strong female characters today, there weren't nearly as many in the late 80s. 
Her character is fundamentally built upon strength. Other M takes the character in a bold new direction, if you can call it that. Sakamoto claimed he wanted to explore the character of Samus. For this game, that meant exploring her relationship with her commanding officer, Adam. She's only allowed to go on a mission with Adam if she agrees to follow his every order. On paper, that sounds okay, but in practice it just serves to aggravate the player. Samus as a character before this game didn't really have much going for her. Like I said earlier, strength is a core part of her identity, but that's about it. Everything else is what the player extrapolates from that strength. Her strength, her arguably one defined character trait, is subverted viciously in the story here. She constantly has to defer to Adam about what to do and what weapon to use. If this is just a story problem, then I can see forgiving it in favor of great gameplay. It's kind of what I did with Fusion. But the gameplay directly suffers here as well. You don't find traditional upgrades like beams and suits laying around in the world like all the games before it. You technically have them all from the beginning, you just aren't authorized to use them. Progression and growth is at the heart of Metroid games. And there's no progression or growth if Samus technically has the abilities, but she just chooses not to use them. Other M is a game that directly goes against a lot of what made the series great to a lot of people. Sakamoto, in his attempt to make Samus more relatable, just pissed off the fans that loved the games in the first place. Now I don't think he's wrong for taking the character in that direction. Metroid is practically his baby. He can do whatever he wants with it. But if I was in his place, trying to make a big budget entry into a dormant franchise, I would value a few things. Of course, I would question how accessible the game should be and what tone to aim for, but before any of that, I would consider why people like the games and the character of Samus in the first place. What makes the series so special to so many people? Why does it top many polls of favorite Nintendo characters despite selling rather poorly overall? I think I can identify the strength of the series as exploration over everything else, atmosphere, and Samus's stoic strength. Metroid Other M has none of that and it kind of tanked the series. Sakamoto said there was nothing he regretted about the game before its release, so he fully realized his vision. This wasn't a result of major corporate interference, he just had a different idea of the character than most fans did. And I think that leads into a discussion whether the characters belong to the creator or the fans, death of the author and all that jazz, but that's out of the scope of this video. I'll just say that while he achieved his goal for what he believed Samus to be, it just wasn't the same Samus that everyone loved. And that's what makes Silent Protagonist special, isn't it? It forces the player to create their own headcanon for the character. We don't know what the character thinks, they don't say anything, so the player's mind is left to wander. While the base characteristics of Doomguy and Samus are set, each of the smaller details is left up to the player. And the developer choosing to elaborate on the smaller details must be wary of alienating the player base, because they just might go against what made the character special in the first place. Thanks for watching. Are there any games that handle the trope of a silent protagonist in a subversive way? Leave a comment telling me all about it. Also, leave a like or dislike or whatever and sub while you're down there. It really mean a lot. Thanks, and I'll see you on the flip.